The latest invasion of our homeland by the Empire of Peron has caught all of us by surprise, but none more so than the Royal Daimar Air Force Training Pipeline. Our pilot training centers, both here in the Kingdom of Daimar and abroad in the United States and United Kingdom, have focused too heavily on the creation of fixed-wing pilots, and we unfortunately do not have enough rotary-wing air crews to meet this latest challenge to our nation's survival. Thank you all for volunteering for our emergency fixed wing to rotary wing conversion course. This first training film will introduce you to the startup and takeoff procedures for the RDAF's AH-64D Apache attack helicopter. The flows and best practices discussed in this video will allow you to complete these procedures in the most efficient and repeatable way as possible, making you both safer and more effective over the battlefield. The view you will be seeing in this training film will be from a GoPro camera mounted onto the helmet of an active RDAF Apache pilot on the front lines, moving through his startup procedure and narrated by the Royal Daimar Air Force Training Department. Welcome to the cockpit of the Boeing AH-64D Apache attack helicopter, the Shah's latest acquisition for the Royal Daimar Air Force. And thank you all for volunteering for this emergency fixed wing to rotary wing conversion course. You'll all be on the front lines fighting back against the Pirani invaders as attack helicopter pilots in no time. The first thing you may want to do upon entering the cockpit is to press the I key on your keyboard to move the IHADS monocle out of your field of view for easier viewing of the small switches and buttons we'll be interacting with throughout the cold start procedure. The first thing you want to do before turning on the battery switch is look down at the left hand console all the way aft by your left hip to the external and internal lighting panel. Anti-collision lights should be set to white for daytime usage. Formation lights rheostat should be brought all the way to the bright position. The navigation lights to the bright position. And on the internal lighting we want the primary lights rheostat all the way to bright along with the standby instrumentation lights as well. There goes some of your future squadron mates, returning from a rescue mission deep into the heart of the Empire of Peron, searching for any downed pilots from last night's Alpha Strikes. On the internal lighting panel, the floodlights can be adjusted based off the lighting conditions that you find in your cockpit for the time of day that you'll be flying. We can now turn on the battery switch. To locate the switch, find the power levers on the left console, move your hand outboard and forward to the round switch, ensure that the key assigned for your aircraft is inserted into the top of the switch, and give it a right click to the back position. We now have main ship's battery power to the avionics of the aircraft. Looking at the upfront display, we can see that it's now powered on, and we're ready to perform a lamp test. The lighting test switch is located on the internal lighting panel all the way at the aft position. Pressing and holding will illuminate all of the light bulbs in your cockpit beneath various switches and warnings. This can also be a great way to troubleshoot your aircraft if you take any battle damage and think that a fire light should be illuminated and you want to test if one of those light bulbs has been burnt out or damaged itself. Moving on from there, we can now perform a fire detection and extinguisher test on the fire detection panel at the top left of your instrument panel. To test circuit one, simply left click and hold, and you will hear the bitch and Betty annunciators as well as illumination of the fire warnings and master warning. Keep in mind the aft deck fire caution and advisory shows up on the upfront display in the upper left corner. To test circuit two, simply right click and hold.
Please take note that the discharge light bulbs for the buttons to discharge the fire bottles to extinguish a fire only illuminate when testing circuit 2. We'll clear out the master warning and we're now ready to start our APU. The auxiliary power unit can be ear-splittingly loud, so we'll go ahead and close up our cockpit now and our CPG will follow suit. That'll also block out the noise from our squadron mates conducting their landings. To turn on the APU, to locate the APU start button, find the power levers once again on the left console, outboard and forward and just aft of the battery switch. Raise the cover with a click and with a momentary press, press the APU start button. And on the upfront display, you'll have the new announcer of APU start and APU power on. Once the APU is fully started up, power will be delivered to all of the systems of our aircraft. Something to note about the AH-64D, which will be very different from the fixed-wing aircraft you're being converted over from, is the APU can power all the systems of the aircraft, and you can set up the entire aircraft without even turning on the engines. This will allow you to save fuel while sitting on the ramp, waiting for your takeoff time. If you also have to land anywhere in the field, you can also shut down your engines and run the APU to save fuel as you wait for the next phase of your mission. After the APU start is complete, I then like to go to the audio panel of my aircraft and adjust all of the audio volumes. Typically, you'll want to ensure that the master volume is set to maximum, turn up the radar and laser warning receiver audio, Turn up the ATA audio, mute the VCR and ADF audio. You can then adjust the volumes of each radio in the aircraft independently or mute them with a click. And if you're flying in multiplayer with a human CPG over SRS, I typically will set it to the hot mic to allow for the easiest mode of communication with my CPG. Moving on from there, we have our standby ADI on the right-hand side of the instrument panel. I will typically uncage this and then move on to setting up the avionics of my AH-64D. Now, the entire point of this tutorial is to give you guys a easy, efficient, and repeatable way of starting up your AH-64D Apache helicopter before you start flying it in training. The best way to set up all the systems of the aircraft is to move along the bezels of the MPDs in a clockwise fashion, starting with the COM button and finishing up with the VID button. Pressing the COM button will bring you to the COM page, and in DCS world, most of this information here is not pertinent to you. The most important subpage of the COM page is going to be the manual button down here on the bottom left. We can now adjust the frequencies associated with our radios in a manual fashion by activating the keypad on the bottom left of our instrument panel. Standard operating procedure for the Royal Dimar Air Force and all other SPUD missions is to set your intraflight frequency for the VH radio. We can see this has activated the keypad and we'll input 133.75, enter, and we can see this has now changed over to our new frequency and is mirrored up here on the upfront display. If for whatever reason we have incorrectly inputted this frequency and need to switch back for clarification on our previous frequency, we can hit the swap button to move the standby frequency over to the main and vice versa. Let's go ahead and set our UHF frequency for our ATC for Meza Airfield. That's going to be 235.55 for today. Now currently set on the manual subpage of the COM page, as well as up here on our upfront display. We've now for the most part finished working with the COM page and can move on to the aircraft page following our clockwise flow around the bezel of our MPD. Clicking on the aircraft page will bring up the same page that automatically populates on the left MPD upon APU or engine start. 
the most important pages on the aircraft page are going to be the flight, fuel, performance, and utility pages for you as a DCS Apache pilot. The flight page brings up the primary instrumentation for flight, and you can set various parameters that you may want to adjust for your flight through the map and through the mission today. Simply click on set, and you can change the units from kilometers to nautical miles. Coming from fixed wing aircraft, nautical miles may make more sense for you, as well as match you up with what your fixed wing support units are using for their distance measurements. The radar altimeter is set on by default, and we can see this by the filled in dot. In the Apache, all systems that are currently turned off have an open donut and ones that are currently turned on have a closed dot. You can also adjust your altimeter setting with the pressure button up here, which activates the keypad down on the bottom left. So let's try inputting a new altimeter setting of 3011, enter, and we can see that of course changes our MSL altitude value. Let's move that back to standard nines and twos for today's flight, and we're going to use our radar altimeter for our height above the field for our landings and our nap of the earth flight today. If you so choose, you can change the unit used for your altimeter setting from inches of mercury to millibars. This may be more familiar to you if you are currently living in Europe, or if you are at an airfield that only displays the altimeter setting in millibars, such as a Russian airfield. We'll set our low altitude warning to 15 feet for today. And because we're sitting on the ramp at zero feet at the moment, Betty will give us an annunciation of altitude low in a red zero as well as a low annunciator down here by the altitude tapes. For our high altitude warning today, we'll set 400 feet. So that way we don't get too high above the terrain, potentially popping up on an Empire of Peron Army radar and having a SAM fired our way or MiGs vectored onto us. That does it for set on the flight page. Let's go to the fuel page and we can see a readout of how much fuel is in our various fuel tanks around the aircraft. And we wanna turn on our Charlie auxiliary fuel tank to access the 660 pounds of emergency auxiliary fuel in the forward tanks. Moving on to performance, we can see various performance metrics and how they apply to our aircraft both looking at the current performance of your aircraft currently sitting on the ramp or in flight at the current altitude and speed you're currently at. What the maximum values that you can get out of the aircraft in your current state, as well as planned values as well. The utility page is very straightforward. The main things you're gonna to wanna to worry about here as a DCS Apache pilot are gonna be the sensor, canopy, inlet, and pedo, heat, anti-ice in case you get into a very frigid uh, desert evening on the eastern side of the Empire of Peron or the Kingdom of Daimar. Moving on from the utility page, that pretty much finishes us up for the aircraft button. Following that same clockwise flow around the bezel of our MPDs, we're going to move to the TSD page. Moving the scale of the TSD out to 27 nautical miles will automatically populate the map if the aircraft's position confidence is high enough. To view the aircraft's position confidence, simply hit the utility button up here, and we can see we're at a position confidence for the INU 1 and 2 of 0.014 kilometers. You're going to want to wait for takeoff until you get 0.005 kilometers for the position confidence. A change from earlier builds of the DCS AH-64D Apache might be the fact that earlier tutorials might show you to turn on the Doppler, but it is now on by default for both INU-1 and INU-2. We can see we have satellites locked and ready to give us positioning data from the, our GPS systems, and we can change our time from local to Zulu time. 
keep in mind that most time on target time references are going to be made from Zulu time so that aircraft have a common value to base their timing off of. Moving on from this utilities page, we can go down to our route and set a direct to waypoint 1 so that way we can get symbology in our IHADS monocle of where waypoint 1 is located in space around us. One thing to also adjust as you set up your TSD page for your flight is to go to the show button up top, change your phase to the attack phase, and box current route to show the current route for your navigation as you're engaging targets in the attack phase. This will allow you to navigate to your next waypoint after attacking a target without having to change your TSD phase. We'll change that back to navigation for now, and we'll back out of the show subpage. And we'll go to the map button, and we can adjust the chart type from a digital chart to show us the topography of the terrain we're flying over to the normal moving map type chart, which I find to be the most usable and the most uh, important for flying and navigating around the map. A satellite image, as well as a blank stick image. Again, I find chart to be the most useful, and I think you will as well. Moving on from the map sub page, we're now currently done with our TSD page. We will probably check this later to ensure that we have a confidence of 0 0.005 kilometers before takeoff. Moving on from TSD, we can open up the weapon page. And at this point, we're need going to need to bore sight our IHADs. To bore sight the IHADs, we're going to want to press I on our keyboard to move our IHADs monocle back into our field of view. We're going to select IHADs, and we can now see that we have our screen cursor now populated on our right hand MPD. The cursor is a fantastic tool to allow you to interact with the various menus and screens of your MPDs without taking your hands off of the collective or cyclic. Simply moving the cursor around will allow you to interact with the various options displayed around the bezel of the MPDs. Note that an option is now selectable when the text becomes bolded underneath the cursor. The keybinds that you're going to want to have set to use the cursor are going to be cursor controller down, left, right, up, cursor display select button depress to move the cursor between the left and right MPDs and the cursor enter depress. Using the cursor to help align your IHADs is absolutely key to allow you to simply have your hand on the collective and not have to reach forward and press on the MPD bezel button which could throw off your or sighting for your IHADs monocle. Zooming out we can see the concentric circles of the bullseye in our bore sighting window. If for whatever reason you do not see these concentric yellow circles, you will want to check your primary lighting. And if these are not on, the bullseye will not be displayed. Simply adjust your head positioning via side to side, up and down, and shifting your shoulders left and right to bring the bullseye to the very center of the window and place your IHADS monocle right in the very center. Hit cursor enter to save the bore sighting. The bore sight solution is now saved for the rest of your flight and you can press the I key to move the IHADS monocle out of the way until you're ready for takeoff. Back out of the bore sight sub page Hit the ground ordinance, a ground or the ground override button, and we can move to the ASC subpage, arm our chaff. We can select a manual or program for chaff release mode. Go to the utilities and turn on power to our radar and laser warning receiver. Keep in mind that if you do not turn this on, you will not receive any warnings from any radar, SAM launches, or any lasers that are currently pointed at your aircraft. Once I'm on the ASE subpage of the weapon page, I then to come up to the common missile warning system panel and turn the system on. 
it will run a simple bit to ensure the system is working, but if you do not trust this bit, you can move it to the test position. We'll go ahead and arm the system, and we'll leave it in automatic as opposed to bypass. You can set it to bypass if you're worried that the system will dump too many countermeasures too quickly in the automatic mode. You can also adjust the audio as well as the brightness of the lamp itself. Moving back to the main weapon page, we can adjust the channels that we have currently set for our Hellfire missiles and laser rangefinder and designator, as well as adjust the codes set for those channels. The utility page has another set of other options for your various weapon systems. We're now going to waz our gun for providing security with our, eight, uh, with our IHADs and the gun from our back seat. My acquisition source I almost always like to have set to TADS so that way I can keep track of where the gunner is pointing the TADS through my IHADS monocle. And for the gun I like to set the manual ranging to 1000 meters. 1000 meters is a perfect point to allow you to engage targets rapidly using the IHADS monocle and the gun that are at close range. And if you have to shoot at something a little bit further away, you can just use some basic Kentucky windage following the impacts of your rounds. This is why we're going to keep it limited to 10 rounds per burst, so that way we don't accidentally dump too many rounds while trying to adjust our Kentucky windage onto a target. Using automatic ranging over the undulating mountains of the western portions of the Empire of Paran and the Kingdom of Daimar leads to your bullets going pretty wild, so I highly recommend leaving it in manual range. Moving on from there, we're done with the weapon page. We don't have anything to worry about on the FCR as the Royal Daimar Air Force has not yet procured the fire control radar for their AH-64D Apache attack helicopters. We can move up, adjust the brightness of our MPDs, adjust the video brightness, and finally complete the clockwise flow around the bezel of our MPD at the vid button. I typically like to have the TADS repeater up on my right MPD and my TSD up on my left MPD. We're now ready to start our two engines and get ready for our takeoff. As you guys can see, the entire operation could be done on purely the power from our APU, saving us a lot of fuel. To start the engines, locate the engine start switches just outboard of the power levers. As a fixed wing pilot myself, I tend to be in the habit of starting the number two right hand engine first, however the order at which you start them do not matter. Simply give it a right click, and when you see NG percentage as a positive value, you can hit right shift and home to bring the power lever to the idle position. We can see on the shadow our tail rotor and main rotor starting to spin, and we can see it mirrored on the TADS view as well. When you see a spike in the torque percentage, that's how you know the, the startup procedure for that engine is complete. There we go, that is a good start for our number two engine. Let's go ahead and start the number one engine. Right click on the number one engine crank switch, positive NG value, right alt and home to bring that lever to the idle position. Let's 
spike in the torque and the TGT lowering back down to a nominal value shows us that the start for our engine one is complete. With engine power now on, we can go ahead and recage our standby ADI to re erect the gyros. Fantastic. Now bring up the TSD page on our left MPD. We currently still have a direct to set to waypoint one, and we are ready for takeoff. We'll hit the I key on our keyboard to bring the IHADS monocle back into our field of view. And at this point, we're going to want to bring the power levers to the fly position. One thing to note here is the aircraft will not generate enough power through its generators and alternators without these power levers in the fly position. So do not turn the APU off until you have the levers in the fly position. We'll just slowly and gently bring the levers up. We do not want to spike in the TGT or to over torque the main rotor. And we can see and hear the rotor blades spinning faster and faster and faster. At this point, we can now bring the APU down and recover the button. We can see on our upfront display that our APU advisory is now off, off, letting us know the APU is currently down. Now here at the current parking spot we are at, at Meza Airfield, we have a headwind pointing right down the center line of our helicopter, as well as we are on, a, on an inclined slope down towards our tail. When we turn off the parking brake, we're going to start sliding backwards. And we're going to want to counter that with our wheel brakes. And then eventually, as we start to pull up on the collective, we'll counter that by pushing forward on the cyclic. Pushing on the wheel brakes on your toes will automatically turn the parking brake off. And you guys can see there how we are starting to slide backwards already. For a proper takeoff in it, in the Apache or any helicopter, you just want to go nice and slow. Slow and steady wins the race when flying any helicopter in DCS. As you guys can see on my controls indicator, we're holding the wheel brakes with our toes and just slowly bringing the collective up and pushing the cyclic forward. We're going to retrim out with the stick forward a bit to counter some of that backwards push by the incline of our parking spot and the headwind. We're just getting the helicopter lighter and lighter and lighter. We'll start to try easing off on some of the wheel brake pressure. See, we're still sliding backwards a bit. And we're countering that with that forward cyclic. We can see as we make the helicopter lighter and lighter on its wheels, the nose is wanting to come to the left just slightly. And now we're starting to drift forward. So we're just adjusting the controls nice and gently as we slowly, slowly start to pick the helicopter up off the ground. The more painfully slowly you go with this procedure, the easier takeoff's gonna be, and you'll have yourself in a nice, easy hover right off the bat. The more gentle and easier control inputs, the better experience you'll have while flying helicopters in DCS world. So we'll start a very gentle hover taxi out to the main pad of the small helicopter base here at Meza Airfield. We'll retrim out the helicopter be able to center up our controls again, make everything a lot more comfortable. And while hovering and hover taxiing, you just want to take everything as slow and gentle as you possibly can. There's no rush for any of this. 
And if someone's rushing you, simply use the magic words over the radio, unable. And our low altitude warning was sounded off by Bitch and Betty there that we set on our flight page. Now we can see the wind starting to push us to the right, so we'll roll the helicopter to the left just slightly. We'll dip our nose forward to gain just a little bit of forward momentum. Starting to rush it just slightly. So I'm going to slow myself down once again. And thankfully, my CPG up front has been talking on the radio for me, and he's gotten us clearance to depart the airfield towards our waypoint one at our own risk, which means that we can take off and leave the airfield however we decide to, whenever we want to. Feeling pretty darn stable now, so we'll go ahead and dip the helicopter over towards our waypoint one. And we'll start to depart the field. Again, thank you pilots for volunteering for the emergency fixed wing to rotary wing conversion course. We know it won't be easy, but it will be worth it to help support our troops on the ground and beat the Piranis back behind the border. The Shah knows who you all are and will keep a close eye on you as he knows you are helping him to fix his oversight and subsequent shortcomings in the strength of the Royal Daimar Air Force. If you liked the video, please like, subscribe, and ring the bell icon down below. Fly safe out there and give them hell, boys and girls.